Hello and welcome to another segment of Western Wisconsin Journal. I'm Jamie Johnson, the government and legal host. And today our guest is a candidate for Congress, Tom Tiffany. Tom, welcome to the show. Jamie, it's good to be here. Uh, great to have you. Well, um, there's been kind of a surprise uh, announced retirement. Sean Duffy is going to be stepping down and he is not serving out the rest of his term, I understand. That is correct. So when is his time effectively done? So he is no longer the representative for the 7th Congressional District. Uh, that ended in September. I think it was September 23rd. It was about a month after he made the announcement at the end of August. Okay. And so that seat is vacant at this time. Yeah. So we got no voice in Washington here in the 7th Circuit, 7th had, District. That's right. We have no voice in Washington. And I was really hopeful that Governor Evers would call this election earlier than uh, what he has. The primary will be February 18th. And then the general election for this special will be May 12th. Um, so it won't be until May 12th that the 7th Congressional will be represented out in Washington, D.C. Well, actually, he did announce earlier dates. He had a December primary and a February general, but people, I don't know, complained that that was too quick or it conflicted with federal rules or something? Yeah, there was a conflict with federal law for okay. overseas voters, and so they had to correct that. And so anyhow, um, those dates are set now, and we're running. Yep, February 18, primary, which coincides with the spring primary for the nonpartisan elections. That is correct. Uh, but uh, this will be a partisan. Um, and if there's a primary, I should say, because you need two candidates with sufficient signatures, correct? That is right. What's your deadline for getting signatures in? I think the deadline is December 2nd. I have to double check that. We're telling everybody the end of November, so we make sure we get right. them in. Good but idea. you have to get 2,000 signatures for a congressional Where seat. do those get turned in at? Um, I believe they get turned into the um, Elections Commission. Here in, in Wisconsin. Here in Wisconsin. Yeah. Yes. You don't have to fly to Washington, D.C. I, I, I don't think so. Yeah. I better double check that, but um, <laughs> I think that's correct. We're well, just working on getting the signatures. So um, we should get into your qualifications and background. Uh, obviously, this is your first time for federal office, correct? That is correct. But you are currently serving in state office. Yeah, yeah. Well. So let's talk about my background a okay. little bit. Yeah. It's great to be back in western Wisconsin. I grew up over here. Grew up on a dairy farm in just north of Elmwood. Okay. Uh, five brothers, two sisters. Used to get up at 6 o'clock in the morning and feed the calves as a 10-year-old. And mom and dad taught us the value of hard work and, more importantly, teamwork. And I went on to college at UW-River Falls. Got an agricultural degree there. Spent a number of years in southern Minnesota. And then uh, 30 years ago, I moved up to Manaqua. And that's where I met my wife, Chris, and we owned Wilderness Cruises. It's a dinner and excursion boat on the Willow Flowage. We owned and operated that for 20 years. Um, I'm also the dam tender on the Willow Flowage. Okay. I'm a dam man, Jamie. Yeah. And uh, I've been doing that for 28 years, and, uh, my wife and uh, my wife and I are just like a lot of families across Wisconsin. We work two and three jobs to make ends meet. I have three daughters, Carlin, Lexi, and Catherine. Catherine is in high school yet. Uh, Carlin and Lexi are in college. And um, I've uh, served uh, in a number of ways locally, um, been on a local chamber of commerce board in Manaqua, served on the Oneida County Economic Development uh, Commission, and uh, served two terms on our town board, and uh, currently serving in the state legislature, just finishing my second term in the state senate. Okay. So were you in the assembly before you were in the senate? Yes, I served two years in the assembly. Okay. All right. Now, um, backing up, you mentioned about just north of Elmwood. So that was like right near the Dunn County, Pierce County border. That's right. And you mentioned UW River Falls. So what years would you have been there? So I was there 76 through 80, graduated in 1980. Okay. And agricultural economics. And in fact, a uh, professor at UW River Falls left a great impression on me that still um, guides me in regards to economic policy. And uh, that was Glenn Potts, who ran the economics department. Um, he uh, turned me on to Milton Friedman and the Chicago School of Economics. And um, you know how you get great teachers that really motivate you and leave an impression. He was one that did for me. Okay, well, I think we might hear about Milton Friedman or at least economics <laughs> as we get into your areas of focus. Yeah, um, for sure. So your background, um, you know, 
you said 6 a.m. getting up. We got up at 5 a.m. to milk the cows, but it was... Uh, Maybe I was a late riser. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, no, if you, you had uh, a lot of siblings, so um, the, pl the farm was the place to raise um, kids, especially uh, 60s and 70s. So uh, anyway, you have three daughters, and you, you said some were in school. Has anybody graduated from college then? Uh, unfortunately, no. We're okay. still paying for college, but Carlin's going to be done in a year here. So <laughs> well, I, we made it through three through college. So uh, that, but anyway. Um, so and the offices. You said that you're finishing your second term in the the, the Senate. So you've been in state office what five six years? Yes. Yep. Okay, and before that, you were on the town board then? Yep. Not simultaneously, like with the assembly? There was a brief like overlap in the assembly. Okay. Yeah, there was a brief overlap. And any um, partisan office prior to, you know, five years ago? No. Okay. Nope. And uh, we should say you're a member of the Republican Party and have run on the Republican Party all along? Yes, I've, um, yes, that is correct. All right. Well, let's talk about, we got your qualifications and your background. Now, what's your motivation for running? If you are working two, three jobs and so forth, why uh, do you want to be, uh, first you were in Madison, now why would you want to go to Washington? Yeah, I think it's that background. Um, so I think about my daughters and are they going to have the same freedoms and opportunity that we've had growing up? And I think that's in question at this point. I think our way of life, it's looking at the, the way things are going in Washington, D.C. right now. People are talking about changing our way of life. I mean, I take a look at like healthcare. There's a proposal out there to eliminate health insurance. The major candidates, uh, presidential candidates, are talking about eliminating private health insurance. Tens of millions of people um, are, are dependent on that. Those are some of the, the ones on the farthest left they're talking about. The, the, right. There's a number of them that have put forth for proposals like that. There's also a proposal in Congress to end animal agriculture. I mean, my gosh, we are America's dairy land and they want to get rid of cows. And when I tell people that, they're like, are you serious? Is that really, <laughs> that proposal really been made? It has been made. And what is happening is there's an open embrace by some out in Congress of socialism. Socialism has never worked and it will not work in the future. And so I want to protect that way of life. I want to fight for our freedoms out in Washington, D.C. so that my daughters, the next generation, and the generations to follow, that they have the same freedoms that we've had in this country. Okay. So that's your motivation. What's your campaign theme? Freedom. It's, it's to give people freedom and opportunity. I mean, I, I'll give you a quick example. This is a really pretty simple issue and it's small in the scheme of things, but I think it really highlights what's going on in Washington, D.C. A number of years ago, there was a, um, uh, Michelle Obama advanced a proposal to change how school lunches are provided for schools across America. I have had local cooks seek me out from schools up in our area and say, Tom, this is not working. We are throwing away most of the food and the kids aren't getting the dietary requirements that they should have. This is the heavy hand of the federal government that is in intruding into what should be local decisions. It's those type of things that are really, um, that are harming our country. And if there's something that I wanna work on, it is that, to bring control back to the local level because it's not working as with all the mandates that we have at this point. Any other examples besides school lunches of mandates that you would like to see roll back? Oh yeah, um, there's a, uh, if we talk about legislation here, um, there's something that I want to um, propose as soon as I get out to Washington DC, and that's to implement the RAINS Act. The RAINS Act would um, put controls on the mandates that are being proposed by bureaucrats out in Washington, D.C. Um, quick example, there was a proposal for something called Boiler Mac a number of years ago that would apply to industrial companies. There's a paper mill in Rhinelander, Wisconsin that had to build a $13 million smokestack in order to ostensibly reduce the amount of emissions that they give from that paper mill. They spent the $13 million, they built the stack, do you know how much emissions were reduced? Zero. Nothing. 
it's those type of mandates that we're getting from the federal level that have that, that have no benefit for society that we need to rein in. And, and that happened as a result of not a law from Congress, but just by a rule change by, a bureau, by bureaucrats out in Washington, D.C. We need to stop that type of thing because you have costs like this to a paper mill that are having no benefit to our society, no benefit to the people of the state of Wisconsin. We really need to rein that in. Okay. So moving on then to issues, you mentioned the campaign theme of freedom and I could so draw some correlation with uh, various issues, but where, what, what do you see are the three or four main areas of focus that you think this election is going to be about? Uh, uh, I think things that are really important at this point include the deficit. I mean, that's why I originally ran. I mean, I've been a small business owner my whole life and dedicated my life to that owning, operating businesses. And I came into the legislature as a citizen legislator to change what was happening in Wisconsin. We had a $3 billion deficit. That's gone now. And we have surpluses in Wisconsin. We need to do the same thing at the federal level. The deficit is out of control. I think we need to deal with health care. Um, there's a proposal currently to have a takeover of the healthcare system at the federal level. That is the wrong way to go. Healthcare is an individual decision. We need to bring control back to the local and state level and have solutions come from individuals themselves because our healthcare needs are all individual. We're not the same. Mm -hmm. And if we allow individualized decisions that happen at the local level or at the federal level, or excuse me, at the state level, we're gonna get much better solutions than this cookie cutter approach, one size fits all approach that would happen at the federal level. Another thing that I'd work on is the USMCA, the trade agreement that is before Congress currently. Um, our farmers are depending on that. Um, and it is really unfortunate at this point that Speaker Pelosi has not taken up this issue. And if I go out to Washington, D.C., I will press every day to get USMCA before the Congress and get a vote on that. It's, it's too important for our farmers to allow it to languish. Okay. So you mentioned uh, uh, deficit, health care, trade. Uh, any others? Yeah, there's a couple other things that I think are really uh, fundamental and, and they're constitutional provisions that uh, we need to make sure that we protect. And that is the freedom of speech. The First Amendment to the Constitution was put in place to protect political speech. That we, the founders put that in place because they wanted to have open, um, open, honest discourse by whoever wanted to participate in the public square. We're seeing in universities across the country the squelching of political speech. We have people that are being um, denied their ability to be able to share their views within our universities. That's really a travesty. We're seeing groups like Antifa that are attacking people when they're out in the public square and they just want to share their political beliefs. We need to restore that good, robust, honest public discourse um, for political free speech because our country was built on that. The other thing is I will protect the Second Amendment to the Constitution. I think that is also one of the, 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 the bedrock um, uh, bedrocks of our Constitution. Okay. And what does that mean to protect the, the Second Amendment? Um, I think you see proposals that, I mean, take a look at the state of Wisconsin here. Uh, Governor Evers is talking about universal background checks, which is code word for gun registration. And uh, I do not think that we should uh, move in that direction. Now, um, we're all concerned about the mass shootings that have been going on. And we've done something. Um, I've certainly voted for legislation that has protected our schools. Um, additional money in this budget for mental health. Things like that can be done. But to just take away legal, law-abiding gun owners, um, to, to take away their guns or to deny their rights is not the route to go. But not to push back too hard, but if you get rid of background checks, then how do you know if they're legal, law-abiding people that are getting the guns? Um, we have a, a really good system at the federal level called NICS that does those um, background checks at this point. And uh, now if somebody brought forth a proposal that would make the NICS, um, uh, the NICS uh, process work more effectively. I'm open to listening to that. But I oh, so you're not against background checks, just... No, that's not what I said. Okay. I said the NICS system of doing background checks is, has worked at the federal level and um, 
I think we should continue to use that process of the next okay. Yeah, because I thought checks. like background checks, that's pretty, even gun owners agree kind of that, that some background checks need to be done. Um, yes, and I think you're, and I think the question is appropriate that you're putting out there. So yes, the next uh, system of checks, of background checks does work. Right. Um, um, gun registration is not necessary. Okay. Well, I have to go back to your first issue because the deficit is something that I've talked about uh, four presidents ago and continue. Um, what would you propose? Because, um, you know, with the, the current administration, we've seen the deficit more than triple. Uh, so how would we bring that down? I think you reduce the size of uh, the federal government. First of all, um, I think there's a lot of people that are filling positions out in Washington, D.C. that are, are really not doing something that's effective for the taxpayers of Wisconsin or for the country. I think you start there with unnecessary positions. And so does that, I is, always, that is that across all uh, avenues of, of government? Uh, as far as the general size of the federal government you think needs to be reduced? Yeah, we need to reduce the size of the federal government. And, 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 and so how I equate it is that, you know, how do you eat an elephant? Mm -hmm. a bite at a time. I mean, we had a $3 billion deficit here in Wisconsin. Our finances were a mess back in 2010 when I chose to run for office. And that was one of the main reasons that I ran is to fix that mess. And I told people, you will not do this in one budget. It's going to take a series of budgets. Five budgets later, we now have surpluses. Uh, we have the largest rainy day fund in the history of the state. We need to take those same ideas and principles to the federal level. It will not turn around immediately, but we need to begin to take those bites out of the elephant in order to turn this around over the next decade or two. Um, would you be willing to work with deficit hawks who happen to have a D behind their name? Oh, for sure, for sure. And be, because there could be ideas on both sides of the aisle to, to reduce deficits. And I happen to think, I mean, there was a time when both sides of the aisle worked together and we had a surplus yes. 20 years ago. And now that surplus is gone. Um, the other- uh, And I don't, I don't pretend that this will be easy. I mean, that deficit is so large at this point, it will really be a challenge, but- um, Well, there's some people I, I who have to... you know, resisted um, you know, uh, talk about uh, deficits, actually you know, taking it right out of the top three, four issues where you have placed it. And, and, you know, they say, well, we can't do those things because that means cutting Social Security or Medicare or so forth. Now, obviously, Medicare is part of um, the budget, but what about the notion of a Social Security lockbox and, uh, you know, letting Social Security be self-funded so that government's not dipping into it when there is a surplus in the Social Security side? Um, I guess I'd have to study that question a little bit more to okay. get you a precise answer in regards to that. I would say this, Social Security and Medicare are a promise that we've made to people who have paid into that, and we need to make sure that, um, that they receive that benefit that they've paid for. Right. But um, we saw you know, Medicare uh, Part D was created without any way of paying for it. And I guess that's how you get to the elephant. You get from the skinny uh, bean to something that's much larger by um, adding mandates that aren't getting funded. Yeah. Uh, solutions to health care then without um, of the going the cookie cutter route or totally government funded. Do you see um, just kind of going back to the pre-Obamacare days of just the, let, you know, people who can afford it get it and those who can't don't? Or how would you navigate that? Because once, once the government provides a benefit, it's very hard to take it back. That is accurate. Um, yeah, I think w w um, if you look at what is being proposed currently, and as you said, people on the left are calling for um, uh, a federal run system, Medicare for all. Um, so there's concerns there because first of all, it will explode the deficit and probably bankrupt the country. And so that's a great concern for people who uh, currently are on Medicare. 
uh, we want to make sure that they continue to get that benefit. That endangers that benefit by expanding it to Medicare for all. So we should not do it for that reason. But I think the, the solutions lie at the state and local level. I mean, I just take a look at some of the things that are happening um, um, with like local businesses and others. For example, when I did the rollout for my campaign, uh, we went to an old line manufacturing business in Wausau that um, uh, Merrill Steel, and they brought an in-house clinic in a year ago and they have their own mobile unit that they do house calls for their employees as well as their employees' dependents. They found a way to get control of their health care cost, costs by doing it locally. I think about direct primary care where you have local clinics where you have doctors who are so frustrated with the system and everything that's between them and the patient, whether it's the government, whether it's insurance companies, whatever it may be, they want to just have a relationship doctor and patient. We're seeing those clinics uh, sprout up across Wisconsin. We have one, uh, there's one up in the Rhinelander area. And people can get their primary care for 50 to $75 a month. And that's another good solution. Association health plans, where perhaps you're a business that you can't be self-funded and be able to do like Merrill Steel does, but allow um, local small businesses to pool their resources and form an association health plan, perhaps through a chamber of commerce, perhaps through like-minded people. I talked to a veterinarian in the district who said that type of thing has uh, been proposed by a national veterinarians group. We should allow local approaches to this healthcare concern, and I think people will find affordable ways in which to be able to get to, um, uh, to, get to affordable healthcare. Because for most people, what I'm hearing from them is, they have pretty good access to health care. It's not perfect, but they have pretty good access. It's affordability that is the concern. And then I believe there's also a role for the state. I mean, we have um, the Medicaid program, Badger Care, here in Wisconsin. About a million people are covered by that. I think um, you have to allow a variety of ways at the state and local level for people to be able to achieve um, affordability for health care, access to health care, and it will happen here at the local level, at the state level, at the federal level, you end up with this one-size-fits-all program that does, not, that does not distinguish between individualized needs that we have. Okay. So um, those are some uh, good ideas uh, on, you know, for addressing those issues. What kind of legislation, if elected in May, what legislation would you propose in those first six months you'd be in Congress? Yeah, I'd probably do something along the lines of health care to allow greater options at the local level. I mean, I've seen it, how if we allow greater freedom for people at the state and local level, you're going to get better solutions um, um, for affordable health care. Um, I alluded to the RAINS Act before. Controlling these mandates that are coming from the federal level, in particular when there's no legislation passed, but a bureaucrat says, we are going to change this administrative rule. And that has the force of law. And you end up with the $13 million smokestack that has no benefit for society. Those type of things happen regularly coming from our federal government. It's time to pass something like the RAINS Act to rein in our federal government. Another thing that I would propose right away is to delist the wolf a very big problem in northern and central Wisconsin. And 26 scientists, wildlife scientists, signed a, um, signed a document about five, six years ago calling for the federal government to delist the wolf. It is time to do it. Science says that the wolf has recovered. It's time to delist the wolf. I would also work on infrastructure issues, um, transportation, um, those type of things, because we need to make sure that we have a good infrastructure for the 21st century. You know, whether it's sewer and water, roads, ports, airports. I mean, we have a major port in the 7th Congressional District up in Superior, um, our airports. We need to make sure that that infrastructure is being kept up to date. Because if you look at California right now, with they're having rolling blackouts as a result of their utility out there has not made the investments necessary to make sure that their system is prepared for what, they, uh, for what is going on there. We need to make sure that when people turn on the lights, turn on their faucet, flush their toilets, want to go on, um, uh, go out of a major airport or go out of any airport, that 
that those are all functioning well and I think that's something that we need to make sure we're making the investments in is that infrastructure. Okay. Um, before I ask the last couple questions, I just noticed uh, not in your, you know, folk areas of focus are necessarily upper legislation, is anything having to do with immigration? And I know we're not a border state in the sense of, I mean, we're closer to Canada, than, obviously, than, than Mexico, but um, we've heard a lot of, you know, the focus being on build the wall, don't build the wall, but um, why, what, what, what's your position on immigration? I happen to be of the mind that I think neither side really wants to do anything and they'd rather see it be at the political football it is instead of working with having both sides of the aisle work on something. They had the Gang of Eight, which is bipartisan, had a solution worked out and that all got scuttled by people who were on the far ends of it, each of the spectrum. So where are you at on that? Uh, it's, it's a critical issue. Now, first of all, that is a fundamental job of the federal government is to make sure and protect our borders, secure our borders, know who is coming in and out of our country. And um, that's something that I, I think it's a very important issue and we need to solve that. And I'm a, it's part of what's disheartening out in Washington DC right now when all you hear about is in the impeachment inquiry. This is an issue that should be worked on so that we get a system of immigration that we know who's going in and out of our country and then have a immigration system that works for America, including bringing people in who uh, pass muster, who can meet our laws, that can come in and work in the United States because we have employers that need people to be able to work. I mean, I'm sure you hear it as much as I do. Employers need people to be able to do these jobs here in America, but it has to be done in a legal fashion. I'm hopeful and this is something I'm certainly willing to work on if I'm out in Washington, D.C., to be able to put that system in place. But we do have to have secure borders so we know who goes in and out of our country. We need to make sure that um, we're not just letting, that we're not letting bad guys into the country. People with criminal histories, we should know who's coming in and out of our country because there are good people. I mean, we're a nation of immigrants. Mm -hmm. And we should have a reasonable system of legal immigration, but the border does have to be secured to do that. Well, and you use the I word, um, not immigration and not infrastructure, but neither of those are being addressed because of a third I issue, and that's uh, this impeachment talk. And I break it up into three areas because, um, first of all, we're in a kind of a gray area here of an impeachment inquiry without having any vote been taken. And then uh, there's one issue about whether you, and I'll let you answer, is w whether you believe that there ought to be an impeachment inquiry. And then second is whether there ought to be impeachment, which we haven't heard all the facts yet. But And then third would be whether or not the president ought to be removed from office. And those are three totally separate questions. So where do you stand on the first as to whether or not um, there ought to be an impeachment inquiry. There should not be a, an impeachment inquiry. Um, there have been no actions taken that um, warrant impeachment. Um, it, 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 is, it is irresponsible what Speaker Pelosi is doing right now to call this impeachment inquiry. I mean, look at what's going on here. Ever since the election of November of 2016, there was immediate talk of impeaching President Trump. And we see this drumbeat month after month. And now we get a hearing, which was a closed hearing, where that the public could not see. It's just irresponsible that this has been conducted in the manner that it has. And I equate it to Wisconsin here. Uh, if you look back six, seven years ago when we had the recalls, that was kind of an impeachment where people disagreed with the policy decisions being made in Madison. So people said, we got to recall these people. No, those were policy differences that should have been settled at the ballot box. The impeachment inquiry is, I mean, we saw that with Sheila Harsdorf, we saw it with Governor Walker. And the impeachment inquiry is just like that. These are policy differences. Settle them at the ballot box in November of 2020. It is terrible what has gone on here. Um, and also, 
this impeachment process is coming to fruition much more rapidly than any impeachment inquiry in the history of our country. Being done behind closed doors, that is just flat out wrong. I stand against this impeachment inquiry, and it's, it's just reckless what is going on here. Well, would you advocate for a vote then for whether or not it would continue? Isn't that what they're going to do tomorrow on Thursday, uh, maybe the 31st? They, they, they've scheduled a vote on yeah. whether or not the impeachment inquiry ought to be continued. Yeah, well, well f first of all, if that vote happened and I was there, I would vote against it. But they should drop the impeachment inquiry. They don't have a rationale to defend impeaching President Trump. It is not there. These are okay. policy differences that they have with the president. And, I mean, let, let's be honest what's happening here. They're trying to play out the string with President Trump and prevent him from implementing his agenda because it's been successful. I mean, one of the things that we haven't talked about here is the economy. The economy is doing so well because President Trump has accomplished two of his goals. One was the Trump tax cuts, which has really turbocharge our economy here, both in Wisconsin and around the country. And the other thing is where he's proposed eliminating two regulations for every regulation that's put in place. That has gotten rid of the, um, uh, the mandate that caused the $13 million smokestack in Rhinelander. And so those things have been so successful they know they cannot run against President Trump with such a strong economy, so they're trying to find other ways to distract the public. I believe that's what's going on. The impeachment witch hunt needs to stop. All right. Well, we, I've been told we're <laughs> out of time. I appreciate you coming on the show. Thank you for coming on. And uh, remind folks, the primary is February 18th, uh, should there be a primary for either party, and then the general is May 12th. And so maybe we'll have you back in that interim um, again. Yeah, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak to people here on the, uh, in western Wisconsin. And uh, it's always good to be back to the old stomping grounds. Well, again, thanks for being on the show. And thank you for watching a segment of Western Wisconsin Journal. I'm Jamie Johnson. Keep watching.